that has a heart that she wants to communicate with everyone belongs in this business in a big way. And so, uh, first time to do a testimonial, <laughs> but we have been friends forever, and I think that she is a wonderful woman. And the most wonderful part of it is what she has given us here. Not without some distress for herself, because anything in life that's valuable has some fee, and she'll tell you all. But aside from that, can I just say, Belva, thank you so much. <laughs> I just need to say that a testimonial from Belva is probably one of the most special things that's happened, so thank you. And just before we continue, I would like to say to those of you, and you all know I'm seeing so many faces, this is so many reunions all at one time. So I thank you all. And I would like to acknowledge that, you know, my family is here. All of you are members of it. And my husband Robert is here. I want to make sure people know him because they're all saying, what's with this new last name? I've had it for 20 years and he's the reason. <laughs> Out. You learned a lot about a book from just the chapter titles, and you have some intriguing ones there. You also have some trigger words within, like, a child who returns home should pay rent. <laughs> yes. That's those, baby, those are those, uh, what we call the boomerang kids. <laughs> so let's just talk about what age should one have some knowledge of finance and consider it a necessity, and is there an age when you get so old that you just shouldn't care? <laughs> no. <laughs> In fact, the older we get, the more we should care about what we hopefully did years previous. Um, with women in particular, women have very specific financial issues as we get older. You know, we live longer, we tend to leave the uh, workforce in order to care for children or for elders. So all of those things impact what our money legacy will be and what the real bottom line will be. As far as when to start, I say before the age of three is a bit too soon. <laughs> but I seriously say at the age of three, and the reason that I say that is because isn't that just about the time that kids start saying, I want. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going through the grocery checkout stand with mom and dad. I have seen tantrums, and I've seen parents take food off the conveyor belt just to quiet down the kids who are saying, I want this. I think that's the time when you need to start conversations about the difference between I want and I need. Because that's something that a lot of adults never learned and it's part of the reason that we're in the circumstance that we are. So I think you start teaching children at the age when they first declare they have a want, explain the difference between wants and needs. As my grandchildren will say, a want is different than a need. A need is something that go, go grandma or Robert or one of the other grandparents will help them get a need, they would say, that means we have to go to our pig. <laughs> it Because it means they have to share in some of this if in fact they just want it, but it's not necessarily a need. To the One of the reasons that many people give for not caring more about how they invest and how they accumulate money is they say, I don't understand the market, so I don't know what they're talking about. Every other day it's like a bouncing ball. doesn't have anything to do with my life. So talk about the basics of understanding the language around money. It's very important for everybody to just get a new normal. It worries me when someone says to me, oh, I can't wait for everything to get back to normal. And I say, are you talking about since the recession hit? You want to get back to normal before that? That's not a wise thing to do because that old normal is what got us in trouble. And we all have to accept some responsibility for the recession. Everybody understood that it was a predatory environment. A lot of people were buying a bit more than they really needed just because they could. And if you built the house of cards that way, it was fine until one thing changed. And any one thing that changes then threw everything else out of kilter. It's the reason that I say when I look at how people manage their money, I see number one, this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. You should look at learning about money all the time. Do you use money once a month? Or do you use money every single day multiple times? Then I think that the learning curve needs to be, you read about it regularly. 
you know when you go to the polling booth what money issues are there because they're going to go directly to your wallet. And there's basically no topic that doesn't have a money tie to it. And so as a result, when I look at people not doing the basics, it worries me. The basics are things like you can't spend more than you make. Sometimes people will kind of chuckle and then I'll say it again and they start going, well, do you know the reality is that the average American family overspends by 20% of their annual income? And that then becomes systemic and it's then taught to children who then believe this is just how you handle money. Another one of the basics, uh, people will say to me, uh, I'll get my credit report when I need it. And I say to them, when you need it is too late to be getting the credit report. You get a free annual credit report from each of the credit agencies. So it's not just one, it's three from each of them. So space them, you know, maybe one in January, another one uh, in June, another one in August, another one end of the year, so that you know what's being said about you and your money. But a lot of people think these credit reports, they'll get it when they need it. No, you need to get them read them, challenge anything on it that's not you. Because when you need it and you find something on it, it's not gonna do you any good. It is much too late. Um, another basic is, especially for African Americans, it isn't so much that we have a saving problem, we have a spending problem. And we will continue to spend and spend, even joking about it and saying, you know, I really shouldn't do this, but whatever. We need to recalculate our relationship with money because the whole idea for me of 21st century money is that all of that attitude of somebody else will take care of my money for me is gone. It's a global economy. People are expecting you to know your money, what you're doing with it, how you're using it, how you're growing it, how you're managing it, and how you are teaching the ones below you and above you to be okay, because money flows up and down. So those basics, we need to get back. How do you, how do you involve people who are like so many African Americans, so many people on the other side near the poverty, that this is important even if you are not making a giant salary, even if you don't have a lot of money coming into your home? How do you make it relevant to them when they're worried about just getting that? For families that are struggling and trying to make ends meet, the single most important thing that could be done is to have a budget. Single most important thing. If you walk out of here tonight and do one thing tomorrow for one month, this would be it. Write down every single thing you spend. Did you get a latte and it was four twenty-five? Write it down. Just what it was and the amount. Did you pay your mortgage and it was X number of dollars? Did you buy shoes and it was this or that? Whatever it is. Just write it down. At the end of the month, highlight the mandatory expenses. Mortgage, rent, health insurance, car insurance, food, whatever those things are. Whatever is not highlighted, that's your potential discretionary money. Add that up. And that's what I then say to people who say, well, I can't possibly afford to contribute to a 401k. I can't possibly do that. You can, if you have a budget that tells you very clearly, these are the decisions I have made regarding my money. Here's how I need to recalculate it so that I can figure out how I can better take care of and pay for those things that I want. And the final thing is, and especially for families that are, are feeling very tight margins, talk to the children. Explain to them what's going on. Make the money issue a family affair. Because if you're trying, if, if you have been laid off or if you are having to take less salary because companies are cutting back and you have children and you aren't explaining this to them, they're going to presume that life is still going on as usual. It's a very valuable lesson that can be taught at an earlier age. And for good or bad, usually the early lessons that we learn about money are with us for life. And that's why I'm trying to dispel some of them in this book. Basic to all of the discussion about money, uh, generally there's a relationship issue. And it could be at the beginning of the love, love, love affair, or at the end when we're aging and wondering if anybody really cares. So talk about uh, the relationships 
and partnerships that money makes a difference, either in growing the relationship or <coughs> saying it really ought to stop. <laughs> As I said, there's a money issue to everything. When we talk about relationships, okay, we think of getting married. The number of people who have gotten married and the hours that are spent determining what the dress is like, what the color scheme is, what flowers are going to be used, where the honeymoon is going to be, all of those things, all legitimate and good. But how many people who have gotten married have made an appointment with a financial planner? So that you understand what your risk tolerance is. So that you understand, I'm a spender, he's a saver, what do we do about that? So that you identify those things that going forward are your short, medium, and long-term plans. Because with money, there always needs to be a plan. So that you can say, short-term, which is between now and two years, this is what I want to accomplish. Here's the reason why, and here's the money that's required to do it. So how will I get there? Then there are medium-term goals, which are usually two to five years, seven years out. And then long-term goals, which generally are longer than 10 years. Imagine if you're a couple who's just come together and married, and you don't discuss those things, and you don't know. And so one is saying, I don't want a house, I just want to travel. And the other one is saying, but this is the plan, and here's what I want to do. As I always say to couples, you can talk about it now, or you can fight about it later. But more than anything, more than infidelity, money problems are the single biggest cause for divorce and disruption. So why let that happen? Why let that seed grow? What do I say <laughs> to couples when I am talking to them about love and marriage and money? The best gift you can give your intended is a copy of your credit report. <laughs> And if you can't do that, are there not some issues then you need to deal with? One of my producers, I mentioned this story in the book at CNN, who got married a couple of months before I got there, but we are very, very close friends still. She said to her fiancé, I love you, but I will not marry you until you're debt-free. Debt-free. Now, that's a big order. He did it. Their debt going forward is a debt that the two of them feel they are equally responsible, moving forward they can do this and what have you. But at least a credit report to the person that you are about to marry, if you can't do that, or if it gives you a bit of agita and you're wondering, oh my goodness, what's going to happen, then you need to rethink what you're doing with your money, which is the reason why I say make appointments then with a certified financial planner. I always say fee only. Always know the cost of a financial specialist that you are about to employ. It's a very important question to ask. How do you get paid? So that you understand. So I'm talking about fee only, which is my preference because it's a person that's not selling items or other things. I think there's less conflict. It doesn't mean the others aren't good. It just means you need to understand what you're doing. And just think about this. What a great gift it is to say, yes, the wedding is planned and the honeymoon is this. And we have talked to our financial advisor, our financial planner, so that she or he knows here's our short-term, our medium-term, our long-term goal. Because that will help happily ever after. Even though I do talk in the book about those who have chosen to be happily ever after unmarried and the reasons why many people are choosing that and the money relationship to such a decision. It's your money, so take it personally by Valerie Coleman Morris. Can be purchased at Marcus Bookstore, 1712 Fillmore Street in San Francisco or call 415-346-4222.